pray before we do anything else. God, we come to you now, Lord, and just open our hearts to you today. God, we open our souls to you today, our minds. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, thank you for being here. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would just uh, overwhelm us with your presence, flood us with your, with your Spirit. Teach us, Holy Spirit. And God, right now, I pray for Orlando and those families who are suffering right now because of all the people who were murdered last night. God, what a horrible, horrible thing. Whether you disagree with somebody's lifestyle or not, no cause to murder somebody. So God, there's families who are suffering and struggling this morning. There are the family of the, of the murderer who is dead, the family of those who he murdered, the families of those. And God, I pray right now that in the midst of that, God, that they would sense you as their comfort, as their joy, as their peace, as their strength. And that somehow in the midst of this struggle, God, that you will be lifted up and people will turn to you and that hate will be conquered by love. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thanks so much. Uh, Cindy and I enjoyed a little bit of time off this week and took the grandkids and all the, everybody to, to Florida, to St. Augustine, and uh, spent some time there. But also thank you. We had to come back early. Cindy's mom passed away. And uh, so thank you for all the cards and all the different uh, calls and the different things and the, the huge amount of just outpouring uh, on that family. Cindy and I were talking. I, used, I don't know how people who don't have a church family cope with death. <laughs> I just really don't. But thank you. Uh, Cindy and I both and their family just want to thank you so much. And for the meal that you provided for us after the funeral was just phenomenal. Uh, thank you so, so very much. Thank you so much. Well, uh, we're kicking off a series called The Fourth Dimension, and Barry did a great job last week of setting it up. I've watched the video and, and teaching us how to train for battle in the fourth dimension. And how many of you remember back in the 60s when the, the first 3D movies came out? I know some of you weren't even born in the 60s, so don't even, you don't have to even go there. Uh, but how many of you remember that? I do. Remember they had those, fun, you, you, had, you didn't have to pay extra for it, by the way. It wasn't $27 then, it was 20, you could get a, you know, a large Pepsi and a, a Baby Ruth and a movie show ticket. See, I'm showing my age, movie show. You get a movie show ticket for 75 cents. So you go for a dollar and just have fun. So, uh, but uh, I remember they were those little cardboard things and one lens was red and one lens was blue. And, and, you know, the really thing was, it didn't look like 3D at all on the thing. It just looked like fuzz. And they were just, you know, it was like, hey, look, oh, yeah, that's, that's wild, man. That's great. So it was really more fun playing with those glasses out, you know, riding your bike and trying to stay straight on your bike uh, when you were doing that. But, man, have you been to a 3D movie lately? Holy cow. I mean, yeah, aside from the fact you've got to pay, take a loan at the bank to go to the movie, uh, those 3D movies are like amazing. And you know, in the old day when they first started, they were just novelty effects. You know, like the arrow would come like way out at you and everybody in the movie go, oh, that kind of thing. Now you're watching, literally you're like sitting in the middle of the jungle and there's snakes around behind you and there's all this, it's just amazing. It is so real. It's just staggering how real it is. And to be honest with you, it, it really scares you. It's not a novelty anymore. It really, really scares you. And and I was thinking about that, and as human beings, we sort of feel like we live in this world where we're wearing our 3D glasses and we're watching a 3D movie. You know, we're, it's, it's all the different dimensions, what you, can, what you can see and feel and taste and hear and smell. But you know what? Sometimes we think that's all there is. And that's one reason I like that bumper, because it showed that city, and it says, this is what you see. And then it showed the city again and said, this is what's really happening. And it was all the different stuff going on there. And so in God's word, it says that there's actually a fourth dimension. And that dimension is a dimension. I, I feel like I'm talking, I feel like I'm Rod Serling doing Twilight Zone. <laughs> you know, dimension of sight and sound. Uh, but, uh, 
There's a fourth dimension, and, and in God's Word, it says it is a supernatural dimension where supernatural stuff takes place, okay? And it's a, it's a dimension where spiritual beings exist, all right? And there's, there's in, this, in this dimension, there's a battle going on. It's a battle between good and evil. And it's not like Star Wars or anything like that. It's a real battle going on between good and evil. And you have, you have God and you have angels. You have uh, Satan. You have demons and all these different uh, minions. And so there's this constant struggle that's going on between good and evil in this dimension, this fourth dimension. And here's the thing, guys, it directly affects you and me. Now, we can close our eyes and pretend it ain't there, but guess what? It's there. Okay? It's there. If you were in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania on uh, July 1st through 3rd of 1863, you could sit in that house and pretend that there was no battle going on around you. That thousands of men were not dying right at your street and in your cornfield and in your wheat field. You could do that, but guess what? If you stepped outside you better realize there was a war going on out there. And that's the way we are. We try to hide inside our shells. We say, well, it's, it's, you know, I, I know, but it's just not really. If I just stay inside, it's not going to bother me. Wrong, it is. You know, the, the only civilian, civilian casualty, golly, I can't talk today. The only civilian casualty in the Gettysburg War was a girl standing in her kitchen making bread, and a bullet came through the door and killed her. She was inside her house, in the safety of her house, and the battle came to her. Folks, you can stay inside, but the battle's going to come to you. And there's a war going on. So we need to talk about that. We need to think about that. And as Barry was saying last week, and as we need to, to understand, Satan hates God. Okay? Satan hates God with every fiber of his being, with everything about him. And his main goal in everything that he does is to rob God of his glory. Now, how is he going to do that? He's going to hit you and me. That's his, that, you're his prime target. Because you see, you and I, we, we're the high point of God's creation. He created us in his image to bring him glory. He created us to live our lives in such a way that through our love for Him and our commitment for Him and our obedience to Him and our relationship to Him, that He would be worshipped and that He would be glorified and that He would be lifted up. That song's so beautiful. That He would be lifted up and exalted. And Satan does not want that to happen. Satan does not want to happen what is going on in this room today. We've talked about this before. Satan does not want Outbreak Church to exist. Satan does not want Outbreak Church to bring Christ and the gospel to South Rock Hill. And he's doing everything he can do to stop it. He's making some of you feel like you're unworthy. He's making some of you feel guilty about stuff. He's making some of you feel uh, depressed so you won't show up for things. He, Satan is working overtime, guys. And, and like we've talked about before, and, I, and I'm, not just, you know, I'm just not saying this flippantly. Never in my life, in 30, almost 40 years of ministry, have I experienced uh, spiritual warfare as in-depth as I have since we planted Outbreak Church. Not only in mine and Cindy's life, but in, in the lives of people that we've come in contact with. I almost want to tell people, if when you pick up one of these little bracelets and it says, I'm contagious, we ought to put something on the other side that says, I'm a target too. Because <laughs> Satan's coming after you. He's coming after you financially, physically, spiritually, every way he can do that. He does, Satan, he's just going to fool with you. Guys, we are right smack in the middle of that. Listen, I want you to understand this. Guys, the church is not a country club. Okay, it's an army. And the church is not a place where we come hide but it's a place where we come to be trained, to be re renewed, to sharpen our weapons, to reload our clips, to get our skills together, to get bandaged up, to get some more water in our canteen, to get reloaded, and go back into battle. 
If you watch the Black Hawk Down, one of my favorite movies, true, true movie, and I watched the, the Navy SEALs that were actually in that the other day. Uh, they were talking, and the Navy SEALs said, we went back to the, uh, to the home base there six times. He said, and when we would go back, he said, the, the first time we went back, we were so shot up and so bloody. He said, the commander said, you don't have to go back. And he said, yes, I do. So he reloaded, got a new canteen, new bandoliers, went back out. They went back and forth six times. He could have easily stayed home and hidden from that, but he didn't. He jumped right back in the middle of it. That's what, that's what church is all about, guys. So what I want us to do today, I want us to keep unpacking some verses that Barry kicked us off with last week. And the first thing I want you to understand about this is that this invisible war is real. Satan wants you to think it's not real. Okay? Now, let me say this. I don't want you to be afraid because God did not give us a spirit of fear. We know who wins. We've read the end of the book. We know who wins. So I'm not trying to make you scared. I'm trying to make you aware so that you know what's going on. So number one, this invisible war is real. Look at Ephesians 6, 12. For our struggle, keep that word in your head, struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of the heavenly realms. Guys, that word struggle right there literally translates hand-to-hand -hand combat. He says our hand-to-hand -hand combat is not against flesh and blood. If you think about Joshua Chamberlain in the main regiment up on Little Round Top and the second day of Gettysburg, guys, when those, when those Alabamians came up that hill, they were, they were throwing rocks at each other. And all of a sudden they started fit. They, were, they had nothing to fight with. They were fist fighting, trying to take the high ground. Because that's exactly what Paul's saying here. He's saying, look, fix your bayonets because you ain't got no more bullets. This thing's going to get tight. You're going to be looking them straight in the eye. Paul's saying our our hand-to-hand our -hand combat is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, the powers of darkness, and the spiritual forces. We're going to break all that down in, in another week. But... Guys, we're in, a, we're in a battle, and there are demons. And I'm going to say that. There are demons. There are demons, okay, that Satan has control over. They are real, and they're not just fantasies. They're not stuff you see in scary movies, okay? And I'm just going to, be, I'm just going to say, I'm not talking about ghosts right now. I'm not, you know, if you're a ghost hunter person, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about demons, Demons. Okay? Guys, we cannot underestimate the, the, the hatred Satan has for you as a follower of Christ because you are God's son. You're a child of it. He hates your daddy and he hates you because of it. Satan's whole goal is to, to destroy the bride of Christ. But guess what? Ain't going to happen. Okay, I love this quote. I don't think I put it up there, but I love this quote. It says, uh, in the New Testament, it is not believers who tremble at the power of Satan, but demons who tremble at the power of God. Amen. Stephen Travis said that. Guys, the demons are trembling at the power of God. Okay. When Paul sounded this, this battle call, when he raised that flag, he wanted us to know who we were fighting. If you fought in the Vietnam War, many people who came back from Vietnam, the, one of the things they said was, we didn't know who our enemy was. They'd be in the rice paddies with us in the morning and shooting rockets at us at night. We had no idea who our, men, who our enemies were. Same thing's happening in Afghanistan right now. You don't, they, people don't know who their enemies are. You can't fight a war when you don't know who your enemy is. 
So you better know who your enemy is. We need to know who we're fighting. Satan may be powerful, but he is defeated. He is defeated. Okay? Look at 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Guys, as soldiers in God's army, you and I are waiting and watching, and we have to constantly be alert. My nephew was a, a machine gun squad leader in uh, uh, Iraq first and two times in Afghanistan. And part of his job in his first tour was to sit in a, in a raised pillbox for 12 hours straight by himself with a machine gun and try to stay alert. And I, I just talked to him about that. Stu, how do you do that? How do you, how, how, how do you keep your mind focused? And he said, I know if I, lose my, if I drop my focus, I'm going to die. Guys, we need to understand Satan does not want this to happen. Satan has some very specific tactics that he uses, and I want you to understand these. These are very, very important. Let's look at these right quick. So how is Satan working today, and how can we be ready for his attack? First of all, look at what it says. He attacks the sick, the weak, and the isolated. So we need, to be, we need to be alert to support and surround people with prayer who are sick, who are weakened because of the stress and because of their uh, depression and because of all those things. People who are, who are pushing themselves to the fringes, Satan is going to jump on them. Listen, some of you stay away from church when you need to be here most. When Satan is rocking you with depression, you don't need to be laying home on your couch wallowing. You need to be around believers of Christ who can support you and lift you up in prayer. You are doing it. When, when you lay at home on your couch, and, and, and I have done this myself. I lost a job one. I mean, I, 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 was, got, I had a job, and the job paid me $3.14 for two weeks worth of work one time. And I was trying to support a family and two kids. Everything went through my mind. I'm a lousy husband. I'm a lousy daddy. I don't even deserve to be here. I didn't even cash that check. What was I going to do with $3.14? I remember laying on my couch considering whether I, whether I even want to be alive when Cindy got home that day or not. Guys, I've been with you in the middle of depression. And Satan laughed at me the whole way. And when, when we stay away from things, when we stay away from the family of God, Satan is loving every minute of it. So please understand that. He attacks the sick, the sick, the weak, and the isolated. He also attacks the newborns. If you're a new believer, you better look out. Satan's after you because you done switched sides. You deserted his army and you done joined God's army. He don't like that. He makes newborn believers face doubts and, and throws temptations at them. And he's trying to weaken their defenses. And you know one of the things that Satan does more than anything with new believers is that he makes them have spiritual pride. New believers have this, have this spiritual pride that is not a godly pride. It's, a, it's an evil pride. And it makes them look down on other believers, even older believers. Okay, so you've got to be careful with that. He also attacks, we've talked a little bit, he, talks, he attacks those people that pull away from the church. He goes after people who are staying away from the family. They're especially vulnerable. If you look how a lion and, and how, how, they, how they attack groups of, of uh, wildebeest and those kind of things, if you ever watch any of those things on, the, on TV, you'll see that what they'll do is they'll, they'll, they'll wait and they'll see a, a wildebeest or something that's lagging behind. That's who they'll go for. Guys, Satan is just like that. If he sees a person in the body of Christ is sort of dropping back, he's going to pounce. Those that are unwary, okay, um, th who just don't even believe it exists. 
You know, I talk to people who've been believers all their lives. And some of these people are, are you know, 70, 80 year old. And they say, no, there's, uh-uh. There are no such thing as demons and Satanists. Do you know how many people who, who profess to be believing Christians do not believe that Satan is real? The numbers, I don't even remember the statistic, but it's staggering. It's staggering. It's way, way up there, like 80, 80 percent, 75, 80 percent, something like that. And then he attacks using fear. Okay, he lo Satan loves for you to look at the world and to look at the newspaper and look at the news and wring your hands and go, oh my God, what are we going to do? That's fear from Satan, guys. The, the, climate, the economic, the social, the political, all that stuff, Satan loves for you to wring your hands and get scared about that. Don't let Satan's fear drive you away from God's power. Now, once we figured out who the devil is as our enemy, you've got to understand who he is and how he operates, and that's what we just talked about, so that you can resist him. Resist the devil. Resist. Okay? Look at the next verse there. It's coming up. 2 Corinthians uh, 10, 3 through 5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Just like Paul, Paul is saying, look, I'm human, but I don't have to use human weapons to fight this thing. Okay? He says right here, he says the weapons, on the contrary, we have divine power. Say divine power. Divine. Say, I have divine power. I have divine. You have divine power given you by God to stand up to Satan in anything he throws at you. Use it. Use it. God's weapons are available to us to fight against these strongholds that he talks about there. But here's the thing. You've got to choose to use the weapon. Okay? And, you're, and what you're doing is if you're not choosing God's weapons, you're choosing the world's weapons. There is not, there's not this place where you don't have a weapon in your holster. You've either got God's weapon or the world's weapon. I don't know about you, but I want to step into this thing with God's 9 millimeter in my pocket. And I want God's 15 shells in my clip because that is divine power okay Paul says look you've got mighty weapons you got prayer you got faith you got hope you got love you got God's words you got the Holy Spirit guys what else do you need what else do you need guys this war is real and it has eternal consequences for us look at Luke 19 I mean 10 19 Luke says, uh, Jesus says, look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Guys, it, it, what part of that you don't understand? What part of all do you not understand? All is all. I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Nothing will injure you. Folks, that sounds like victory to me. Guys, we are, listen, we are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory. The victory was won on the cross when Jesus beat death and Satan and gave you the keys to hell and said, go on down there and take that place. It says the gates of hell are not going to prevail against you. That don't mean they're going to, they not even, you're going to walk toward them and they're going to fall down. That's the power Jesus has given you. And we sit and we, and, and, and we just, we as Christians worldwide just sit like little sissies. I don't know other way to say it. Well, we've been given the power of God to break down the strongholds. And when I'm talking about strongholds, I'm talking about the strongholds of that, that depression that's got your sister in shape or that, that uh, health issue that's got your child in shape or that uh, spiritual issue. Uh, all those, that's the strongholds I'm talking about. Guys, you have authority in the name of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit to tell Satan, get out of here. Amen. 
You've got that power. Use it. Don't go, oh, oh, oh. no. After the end of the Second World War, some of you know this, throughout most of the islands in the Pacific, there were still groups of, even after the treaty had been signed, the war was actually over, there were still pockets of guerrilla fighters that fought on most of the islands in the Pacific long after the war was over. In fact, they found one guy in 1978, I think it was, who was still hiding in a cave and still, mo still watching his, his island. He, he didn't, know, didn't know the war was over. You know, 20-something years after the war. But listen, these guys, even though the war was over, this guerrilla warfare was still going on. And guys, listen, the bullets were just as real and the dead was still just as dead. Satan, see, that's what's happening. We won the war, but there were still some people who were, who were determined to keep guerrilla warfare going on. Listen, that's what happens with Satan. Satan continues to fight his guerrilla campaign even after Jesus has won the victory. Satan was defeated on the cross. The penalty for sin was paid for every person for all time. The power of sin was broken. And Satan and all of his people are still trying to fight that guerrilla warfare, trying to discourage you, deceive you, divide you, destroy you, whatever he can do. And listen, Paul says, listen, as believers, you need to take up what we get, what God has given you, and you need to fight. You need to fight. You need to stand firm against the enemy. Now, the second thing here. We need to rely on God's strength when the battle comes. Ephesians 6, 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. You know, you know, be strong in the Lord refers to the strength, not your strength, but the strength of Jesus that is in you. Okay, when I pray for you, I don't say, Jesus, give them strength. I say, Jesus, be their strength. There's a huge difference in that. Huge difference in that. And that phrase literally, I mean, let me read it again. Finally be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. It literally translates this. It's an ongoing process. Listen to the way it literally translates. Allow yourselves to be continually strengthened by the power that's already available to you because of your relationship with Jesus. That's what that literally means right there. The power is already available to you. Just use it. And that's how we fight and win this battle. The same power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to you and I. The very same power. The very same power that allowed Jesus to look at the people who had just torn his back open so that his kidneys were exposed and his back of his rib cage was exposed and his shoulder blades were exposed and his beard was pulled out by the roots. His teeth were knocked out. His eyes were blacked and maybe even gone in some places. His head was a knot of, of knots because of that crown and everything, the same power that allowed him to look at them and say, God, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. That same power is in you and I. So when somebody hurts your feelings, don't tell me you can't forgive them. Don't tell me that. And what we need to do is we allow, as God's people, we allow God to develop our lives in such a way that this power, we start to rely more and more and more on this power. And, and so how do I do this? So you say, okay, here's the way. You got some things that you can do to keep building up your power supply. First of all, get, get involved in a small group. Guys, I cannot express to you the importance of being in a small group. They're listed in your folder there. We've got several others that are coming up. You need to be in a small group. That's, we believe that spiritual growth happens best in a small group and that spiritual warfare happens more power. I mean, the, the defeat of spiritual warfare happens more powerfully with a small group. I don't know about you, but if I was in Afghanistan today, I'd rather have 30 people with me than be out on the field by myself. If you're not in a small group, and I'm just saying this, if you're not in a small group, you're choosing to be out on the battlefield by yourself. 
when you could be surrounded by 30 people, 20 people, whatever it may be. Okay? It's worth the effort. It's worth the energy. Prayer. My goodness. What an arsenal there. We're going to talk more during this series. We're going to teach you. We're going to literally teach you how to pray for deliverance from, from satanic attacks. Y'all look at me like, he's done flip slap out. No. Because this is real. Okay? We're going to teach you things. Bible study. Giving back. Obedience. Sacrificial service. Sacrificial giving. You know, that's what's going on. Now, third, let's jump into this right quick. Use the protection that God provides for you. Okay? Use the protection God provides for you. Ephesians 6, uh, 10 through 20. Let's look at this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. The full armor of God means complete protection, head to, head to toe. Okay? And it also includes defensive and offensive weaponry. All right? Full armor. And this gear, this gear we're talking about here was for hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was not for show. This is not what they'd put on when they were going to be in a parade. This is not their dress blues. Okay? This is their BDUs. This was this, what they were doing when they were in the battle. All right? Paul, Paul talks about this divine outfit and that God has given it to us to, as believers, and he provides everything that we need so that we can take our stand against the devil's scheme. Stand against means you are standing, resisting the enemy. You are holding your position, and you are not going to surrender. On uh, a Memorial Day, I was watching a, 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 a documentary. And it was talking about how in the Second World War on uh, Anzio, okay, some of you who know Second World War, in Anzio in Italy, there was a guy who held one position by himself for eight and a half hours. And the next day when he came, when, when they finally came, uh, people came to get him, there were, um, I don't remember exact number, something like, 68, 70 dead Germans right around the front of him. He didn't even know it. That's how many he had personally killed. And he was, he was doing that because he was said, stand strong. He said, this is your position. You hold it at all costs. That's what he did. That's what he did. Guys, that's what God's calling us to do. He has called you to hold your position at all costs. And the greatest thing about it is the medal you get is not the medal of honor. It's the glory of God. That's the medal you get. Satan's not going to fight fair. He's going to come around. He's going to try everything he can do. So we need the full armor. So let's keep going. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Now look what it says. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your, uh, your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, in addition to this, take up your shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all the saints. And then he closes up by saying, pray for me also that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might declare it fearlessly as I should. Now these, these pieces of armor are literally listed in the way that a soldier would put them on. And they're taken from the Roman armor. And so let's look at them real quickly. First of all, you got the belt of truth. All right, the belt of truth is also called a girdle. It's not like Spanx or nothing like that. You know, it's not that kind of girdle. It's called a girdle. It's about six inches wide. It's usually made of leather, and some of them have some uh, metal uh, stuff embedded in it. But here's the, here's the important thing about the belt. The belt held together all the other armor. 
The breast, everything we've talked about here could be attached to the belt. So the belt was the important thing. It held together all the other pieces. Okay, so the bottom line is the belt is the foundation of that soldier's army. And this belt of truth is the truth. It's the foundation of a Christian life. God's truth is revealed to us through Jesus Christ. And that forms the foundation for victorious Christian living. And that's what I want us to do. Have victorious Christian living. I don't want you going out of here living a defeated life. God doesn't want you doing that. Jesus died so that you could live victoriously. The breastplate of righteousness, okay? Breastplate was a large uh, leather, bronze, and depending on what army you were with, it was either leather or bronze or chain mail, and it protected the vital organs from your neck to here. And it was connected at the shoulders, and it was held together down here as, uh, on the belt, okay? Now, no soldier would go into battle without that breastplate. All right, and, and um, in one of the research I was doing, it was called the heart protector because it actually protected, it was right over your heart. So it protect. So it's kind of like a bulletproof vest today or a flak jacket, something like that, all right? Um, and it's the uh, righteousness is what it's called, the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness gives us that important defense. It shows us, it, it's, it's evidence to the world that you and I are soldiers for Christ, People can look at your breastplate and say, I know whose army you're on. I know whose side you're on. Okay? That righteousness has been given to us through the Holy Spirit. And that righteousness, you've got to understand, that righteousness is the complete opposite of Satan's wickedness. Okay? Shoes of peace. Shoes that are fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The soldiers wore these sandals that were laced up. They were military shoes, and they were laced up, and, and they could, could run in them, and they would protect their feet. And they had these special shoes. They, they were, the, the soles of them were soft leather with metal studs in them. And the metal studs were not to keep them from slipping on the ice. The metal studs, when they braced themselves like this, the metal studs, like, like they would brace themselves and put their shield out like this and put that spear right through here. And they would brace themselves so that when somebody was attacking them, the studs dug in the ground and, and they would not lose their footing. Every time, every time an arrow would hit or every time a sword would hit, they would not lose their footing. Guys, that's what the, the shoes of peace are to you. The shoes of peace are your sure footing. When Satan is knocking at you and hitting at you, everything else, you're sure-footed. That's what we're talking about here. That's what we're talking about. You can stand firm. And then the shield of faith, the fourth one. The soldiers would carry a shield, and most of the times in Roman shields, it was a, an oblong shield, some, usually oblong, some, some were oval, depending on what part of the army you were in. It's about four feet high and two feet wide, okay, it's about like that, and about like that. And you've seen how the Romans would do the thing where they would make the, the, put the shields together and put them over the head and almost like make a, an impenetrable, you know, fortress out of their shields. Um, it was covered <laughs> with, it was wood, it had a metal frame around it, and it was covered with leather. And a lot of times the leather would be soaked in, in uh, water. They'd pour water all over the front of their shield so that when, when the, the enemies shot these arrows that were flaming, which was one of their, one of their things they loved to do, they'd put pitch on the end of it, light it, and shoot it so it would catch anything together. It was kind of like early napalm, I guess you'd call it. And they would do that. And when they would hit these, these shields, they would hold that shield up. It would stick in the wood part of the shield, and, the, and it wouldn't ignite the wet leather. Okay? That's what it's talking about. And that's exactly what he's talking about here. This shield is, is total reliance on God. It means that we are believing in his promises even though we don't see them fulfilled yet. Guys, we've got to believe in God's promises even when we don't see them already. You've got to do that. You've got to do that. God gives faith to protect you and I. All right, so when, when Satan, the liar, the chief, the ruler of this world, sends those flaming arrows of temptation and doubt and lust, despair, you know, anger, problems, trials, all that stuff, you just hold up your shield of faith, and that fire ain't going nowhere. It's going to go out as soon as it hits it. But some of you just lay your shield of faith down and say, Oh, I'm shot. Faith. 
Faith is what gives us the strength to stand even when it's the most, fear, the most horrible weapons. The next one, the fifth one, the helmet of salvation. Guys, this covers, this covers the soldier's head. They were leather, they were brass, they had uh, flaps that came down like this and tied right here. And uh, um, hitting, hitting the helmet, with trying to slice the helmet with a sword, e most every helmet would deflect that. Okay? <coughs> and <clears throat> so the helmet is critical. Now, think about this though. The soldier would put on all that stuff, his belt, his, his toga, all that stuff, his breastplate, everything, pick up his shield, and then um, it says that the soldier would take his helmet from an armor bearer and take his sword from an armor. Those are the last two things he would put on. Guess who your armor bearer is? God himself. Guys, God himself is standing there with your sword and your helmet and you walk up to him and you say, I'm ready. You take those things from God himself. What more power, what more encouragement can you have than that? And look at the sword of the Spirit. Finally, the soldier takes his sword. This is the only offensive weapon mentioned here. Okay? Sword, and you've seen them, the little short sword, about two feet long. Had a blood groove in the middle and had uh, sharp on both sides. Kind of wedged out like that and came around like this. Okay? Um, close combat. That was meant for, you know, that was meant for thrusting. I mean, you, you know, you're looking them in the eye when you're doing that. You're not shooting them, you know, you're not shooting them with a, a drone or anything like that. You're not a, you know, you, you're looking them in the eye. Okay? That's what this is all about. Guys, the Word of God is our sword. God's Word is your sword. So many times we go completely into battle. We'll dress up and look great and leave our sword at the house. The Spirit makes the Word of God effective as you speak it and as you receive it. Guys, you have to speak the Word of God. You have to speak the truth of God against Satan and his emissaries. And the Holy Spirit is what makes that effective. Okay? The Holy Spirit is what gives the Word its sharp and penetrating edge. The Holy Spirit is the, is the thing that sharpens your sword. And when Satan tries to tempt us, our best weapon is the Word of God, our sword. What did Jesus, what did Jesus come back with every time Satan tried to tempt him with in the desert? Somebody say Scripture. But some might say, the right scripture. You know, he wasn't out there 40 days hungering and wanting a cheeseburger or nothing. And Satan come up to him and say, you can turn these stones into cheeseburgers if you want to. And you can have all of them. And Jesus didn't go. Jesus wept. <laughs> he used the right scripture. He used the right scripture. Some of you are Jesus wept in all the time. You don't even know what to use. You got to know. You got to know what to use. How are you going to know it? You learn it. You apply it. You read it. You believe it. You stand on it. You appropriate it. Guys, God's Word is not some book that we just read like a John Grisham novel. God's Word is the Word of God, holy and infallible, given to you and I so we can stand up to this mess. So let's start using it. And then the last thing, prayer. Man, big time prayer. Guys, we can't stand alone in this battle. Like I said, we've got to be praying. And we've got to be praying for each other. So, <coughs> Satan's going to hit us when we least expect it. So we've got to be alert. We've got to be ready. We've got to keep on praying. Keep on praying. Keep on praying. Okay? Y'all may not know who Peter Marshall was. Peter Marshall was the uh, uh, chaplain of the uh, Senate back in, I guess it was probably the 40s maybe. I can't remember exactly. But his wife, Catherine Marshall, 
has a great quote. Listen to what she says. God has given us the total victory of the power of the cross through the weapon of prayer. Isn't it time that we covenant together to pick up that awesome weapon and use it to His glory? It's time, folks. So we've got to put on that full armor. We've got to, we've got to get that whole armor on us, and we've got to be ready for this. So why, and I'm just asking, why would somebody not use God's armor? He's already laid it out for us. It's already there. Why would somebody not? What keeps us from using and relying on God's power? Just several things right quick. First of all, we don't really sense the danger. We don't recognize that, you know, we don't recognize the power of the enemy. We just don't, and nah, mm -mm. Or we don't have all the weapons. Okay. We've never been taught the importance of these weapons and how to use and how to appropriate these. Okay. Or we're untrained on how to use the weapons. Without practice, you can't be ready for battle. We were in St. Augustine this week, and we were over at the uh, Castillo de San Marcos, and we were watching this video about how they used to do stuff back then. And, uh, you know, there was, th they basically did a whole lot of drilling and practicing all the time. And they would stand there, and they would have a guy call out every single thing they were supposed to do, hour after hour after hour. And I'm talking about just loading your, loading your flintlock and firing it. And the thing the guy said was in the video, he said, if they did not practice like this every day, when the battle started, they would forget the important stuff. Guys, so if you don't practice, you're going to forget this stuff. You're going to forget it. it it's got to be ingrained in you. It's got to be natural to you. And that's what practice is all about. So we've got to be trained. And another thing, this Satan loves this one. We just might be in our comfort zone. We're like, well, Satan ain't bothering me. And my question is this. If you're a believer in Christ, why isn't he? Ooh. I'm going to meddling. Somehow or another, when we, when we get in our comfort zone and we're, not, we're just totally oblivious to this war going around us, we kind of have compromised with the enemy. All right? So here at Outbreak Church, we want to prepare people. It's our heart to prepare people. We want to teach the truth. We want to stand on the truth. We want to teach you how to read the truth for yourself and stand on the truth for yourself. Guys, every believer's got to take hold of that power that God's made available to them. And we can't fight this battle without it. We cannot fight the battle without it. Let me close by saying this. First Peter, we read this a while ago, 5, 8. Be sober-minded and watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. I found a great quote. And it says this. The devil's best ruse is to persuade us that he does not exist. Guys, we need to take this invisible war seriously. God's raising an army of men and women who are dedicated to Jesus, who are operating in the power of the Holy Spirit, to take back the territory stolen from Satan. We're putting on the full armor of God. We're using the spiritual weapons and the authority of God and the power of God. And we're saying, Satan, we're not going to take this anymore. Satan, you're a liar. Satan, you are not equal to God. You are nothing more than a created being. And Jesus has defeated you. So, Satan, take your filthy hands off of us. We belong to Jesus and you don't mess with God's stuff. Amen. So I don't know what God's saying to you today. But God's in this place. So you do business with God right now. Jordan and the team are going to come up and lead us and we'll continue worship through music. And after that we'll cover a few things, but uh, I want you just to do business with God wherever you are, whatever God's telling you to do. Maybe you just realize that, that you've been, you know, you thought you were doing the right thing and you've been giving lead way to Satan. Maybe you've been one of those people that's totally ignoring the invisible war. You think, well, if I just hide in my house or if I just hide here or just ignore it or just be like, you know, it doesn't exist and it ain't going to bother me. Some of you are not believers in this room and that's great. I would invite you to come to know Jesus today, to step up into the power. Because listen, if you're not, if you're not a believer, Satan's not worried about you because you're, you're on his team. 
When you step up and you, when you defect from Satan's army and join the army of the Lord, that's when Satan gets mad. There's some people in this room today who need to tick Satan off a little bit and say, Satan, I'm defecting from your army and I'm joining the army of the Lord today. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me the power and the Holy Spirit to defeat Satan. And Satan, in the name of the blood of Jesus Christ and by my faith in him, I, I turn my life over to God and I turn from you and I turn toward God. Whatever God's telling you to do, you do it. Let's stand and sing. God, you are magnificent. God, you are holy and you are righteous. You are just. You are our banner. You are our strong tower. You are our righteousness. God, we praise you and who you are. We bless your name today, Father. Father, we thank you for this food we're going to have here in just a minute and those people who have fixed it. Thank you for the opportunity to just enjoy time together, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat real quick. And uh, uh, Daryl, flip those lights on for me back there, if you don't mind. Uh, just, just a couple of reminders right quick before we give information about, uh, about what to do for eating. Um, don't forget next week is uh, parent-child dedication. If you have children uh, that you would like to be dedicated, uh, and remember that's not salvation. That's just you dedicating your child and, and saying that you want to raise your child in a godly manner. Um, Talk to Miss Frankie, who's back in our preschool area back there. Also, don't forget that we still need help serving with um, the uh, Vacation Bible School, the 26th through the 30th at night. And you can see Miss Barbara and Miss Frankie back in Kids World for that also. And uh, please, 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 don't think because you didn't bring any food or because you're a guest, you, don't, you can't stay. Yes, you can, because we got plenty of food. <laughs> if you've seen that room back there, there's a lot of groceries back there. And uh, so, so please stay. We'd love to spend time with you just hanging out. Um, and um, so before we do anything else, uh, Daryl, you want to give us a word about what to do and how to, how to prepare for the, for the food? Trample each other. Yeah, just don't trample each other. <laughs>